welcome back troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. A couple of rare guitars showed up on Reverb a couple of days ago. Take a look at this. You've seen this shape before, but you might not have seen it quite exactly like this. But that was not my first thoughts when I saw this. It wasn't until I saw this other freaky thing in my Reverb feed that made me stop and go, whoa, 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 what is going on here? So this is what is advertised as the Gibson L6S prototype that Carlos Santana himself has played. And it's got all the Bill Lawrence parts that these things are known for, and it's from about 1972. That's kind of a big deal because the L6S was like Gibson's budget modeled solid body guitar. Like it's not quite a Les Paul, but yet it's still Les Paul influenced because after this things like the Gibson S1 and the Marauder came out, but these were certainly interesting guitars. So here's what the prototype looks like. And here's what the final design ended up looking like, the L6S. Now I have full reviews and demos if you wanna learn all about the models of the L6S, including the L6S, L6S Custom, and the L6S Deluxe, as well as the Midnight Special. But here is what a production one looked like. So most people call these things the flat and pancake guitars. They're not my favorite, but I do like what they represent. But you know, speaking of flattened pancakes, this prototype was pretty bad. Like it doesn't even look like they had the sculpting on the outside quite yet, or maybe just not as much. These are pretty flat looking, but in comparison to what they were going to be, oh goodness, I am so glad they did this. But it's too goofy not to look at. I mean, besides the body shape that they changed, what else is different? Take a look at this no pick guard ever. Like when I first saw this in my feed, I just thought, hey, that looks weird because I've never seen somebody take a pick guard off of an L6S before. The pick guard is a really key component to the look of these things in my opinion. But without it, the chicken head multi-selecting switch really stands out. So initially they had some sort of a inlaid material right there that showed you the numbers that you were selecting. Instead of over here, originally the pick guard would have those numbers, but they would wear off over ages. So in many aspects, I kind of like that design, but this definitely needed a pick guard. As far as our controls, looks like those are just the same. But is our output jack in the same location? No, it is not. They put it on the side. I wonder if this is actually significantly chunkier than a regular L6S now that I've noticed that small detail. I'm gonna have to guess yes. They just took the rolling pin and flattened it out just a little bit more and had to move the output jack to the front for production. Unfortunately, we do not have any side profile views on this guy's listing. But it looks like they were originally going to be shipped with a harmonica bridge that is really, really close to that bridge pickup. You could tell it's close here, but not quite as much. And our tail pieces are actually farther back on the production ones. Whereas this was a little bit more traditional. I guess they were trying to give it more of a slinky feel. The pickups appear to be Bill Lawrence. Unfortunately, no inside cavity shots or looking at those. But they appear to be the right design. They don't have the pole pieces or anything. But check this out. An ebony fretboard with block inlays. So the production ones had maple fretboards and dot inlays. But if you remember, if you check this video out, the very earliest made production ones actually did have block inlays. Those things are pretty rare. I've documented one of those on the show, but they still stuck with the maple fretboard for most of them. Later on, like with the deluxe, they had rosewood. There are some that you can find with the ebony fretboard. Usually it's the special finished ones that got those like the ebony or the tobacco sunburst. They are out there, they're just not as common. So it's kind of interesting to see that initially they thought that was what they were going to use and that's the wood that you see the least often on these. But there was no binding on this prototype or anything like that. But then we get to the headstock, whoa! They were initially going to use the Gibson pre-war logo, what? That looks so strange, especially compared to what it ended up being, just a big, large, regular Gibson silkscreen. Normally, I would like a spec like this, but it just feels so naked without the big L6S on the truss rod cover or something else going on. Maybe they could have left this like a natural maple and did that in black to make it look cool. But you can tell early on they were messing with the whole Gibson headstock shape. I would say this one looks a little bit more elegant whereas this one ended up being a little bit more wide, probably to match the body. Speaking of the body, here's what it looks like on the back. This is a set neck version, and take a look at that control route. 
significantly different from the production model. We still have a little bit of a comfort carve here, but it is very small. Over here, it takes up like a good quarter of the instrument. And this is more like regular Les Paul style. Backplate, not exactly the same, but similar. But what is that on the back of the neck, you're asking? It's kind of a, a peekaboo volute is what it looks like anyways. In this photo, you can kind of see a little bit of a bump, not the traditional volute that we're used to seeing on these 70s models. But what kind of scares me about this guitar is there was never a serial number. I love Gibson prototypes, but who's to say this isn't a fake that someone just made in their basement using spare parts that they had. Now these tuners, they do tell us it's around that 1972 era, so the story is holding up and it is likely true. It's just, this is why I love collecting like late 70s prototypes, because you get this big old Gibson original prototype stamped into the headstock. It's a little bit more easier to know if you have a prototype, because if somebody just gets this guitar, they'll be like, it's some weird L6S somebody modified, I don't know. But no, and then it ends up being a prototype if you know somebody that actually knows the history and the story behind it. So speaking of the story behind it, basically they're saying that Carlos Santana tested this instrument before he gave his final approval as an endorser of the model, despite apparently he really didn't like these guitars at all. The strings have never been changed since he played it in 1972. There's no way to verify that. Why even put it in the listing? I get it. It might get a Carlos Santana fan really excited, but the first thing I would do with that guitar is put a fresh set of strings on it. Those things are decrepit. But it is one of those situations where the possible lore that could be true, I would keep those strings in the case. But he's saying that this very prototype belonged to Bill Lawrence, and that would make sense. What would make me ultimately trust this guitar as being a legit prototype is if they had a nice little letter signed by Bill Lawrence. But unfortunately, it does not look like he is with us anymore. This is one of those, you're either gonna have to believe the story or not. I'm leaning more towards it's likely legit, like 90% of the way, but if they had a nice COA or something from Bill Lawrence saying this was part of my collection, or we could trace it back, that would make me more comfortable to buy this thing. Because he's asking, $8,450. Now, I actually had the Gibson Sonics prototype. That's kind of within a similar territory. And I think this price is fair if you can actually verify exactly what it is. But unfortunately, we, we don't have that last 10% yet. And I'm the only person that made an offer on this. So you can check out his listing if you want. It's J Rosin Music in Emeryville, California. I'll leave a link in the description. But something else that makes me think, hey, this is maybe possibly legit is the one that we talked about earlier. So this was the Gibson L6S bass prototype. At least that's what he's saying. He's saying it could also have some ties to the Ripper and the Grabber, which are like Gibson's most famous basses. They do, they kind of have some elements of each other, like a um, blending of them. Is it possible that this ended up becoming that? Maybe, because the Ripper actually became the L9S, whereas the other one is the L6S. So it would make sense, potentially. But I was actually even more so interested in this one because it was something that never actually ended up going into production. But I thought it actually looked, you know, pretty good for a base. So this shape, maybe not the most attractive. It's just a hump and then you got a one of these. Is it possible that this was actually like a different version of the Les Paul signature bass? It definitely has some elements from that as well. But here, it looks like we have like two coil splitting switches, maybe. Actually, it might just be one of those and then the other one is like a pickup selector or who knows what those are doing. And you might be saying, hey, that finish looks absolutely terrible. Did somebody <laughs> refinish it? No, that, that's exactly how those cherry sunburst finishes were done on an L6S. I actually had one of those before. It looks like it's hand rubbed. It's really sloppy around here. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's just kind of that quirky 70s aspect to it. That, that's what makes me love this. We've got that three point bridge. Looks like two mud buckers on this thing with what appears to also be an ebony fretboard on this one. Block inlays would have made it look even cooler. But then we have a more traditional style Gibson headstock at the top of this one. But the back, ooh, I love the back. They did the finish a little bit nicer and we get the burst on the back of the neck too. I mean, this is a very, very attractive backside of a base to me. Now, 
the the back plate is a little unfortunate. It's it's like a, a lopsided egg, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, I could see why this is definitely in the prototype stages. I guess it doesn't look as bad super close up. But this one also appears to have a maple body. It's got more contours back here. It, I mean, it looks all right. Check out that neck. It is a three-piece maple neck. And you get a giant volute. But what makes me sad about this one is... Not only is it not stamped a prototype, once again, it's not something they did at this time, so I'm not saying that it should have that stamp, but it was stamped BGN, the very lowest stamp you can get. That stands for bargain, meaning there was a bigger issue than just a small cosmetic thing. Now, in this case, it likely meant, hey, this thing's not in production. We can't really put it in our records. Let's just get it out as a bargain and forget about it. That's likely the story. It makes sense to me. But at least this one actually has a serial number. It has a Made in USA stamp. It was likely made in Kalamazoo because, I mean, Nashville wasn't necessarily open at this time. So an original Kalamazoo prototype is definitely something that collectors would be interested in. So this one listed a little bit higher, 8,750. And here I'm doing all the marketing work for them. <laughs> These are just cool. I wanted to share them. I don't care if you buy them or not. Unfortunately, I don't get to document them in person, but they can live here forever in this video. This one though, he does not say that it came from Bill Lawrence. So I'm not sure his history of how we got both of these guitars. Did somebody trade them in? I mean, are these actually counterfeits that just got traded in at the same time to try to build your trust? I doubt it. But when it comes to weird oddball models that nobody can verify, you always gotta be careful. But what a great collection for somebody. They're just priced a little bit higher than I'm comfortable paying with the given information. But compare this thing to a Ripper real quick. Right here, that horn, you can kind of see it when you switch back and forth like that. It is a very similar horn. And this one has two pickups, kind of similar with what we did here, but it does not have any of that rotary switch. And it only has the option of being strung through the top and not through the body. But like the Ripper, it is a set neck. So that's something else that made me interested in this one because Gibson bases, they're not all that popular, especially one that was never necessarily produced. But as far as like a popular Gibson base, these are very popular. They're some of Gibson's most expensive bases, you know, outside of the popular Thunderbird. Now, as far as the grabber, we, we don't really have too much similarities unless you just count that little weird swoop right there. So I think it would be fair to call this maybe an L9S, the Ripper prototype or early concept design, but it was likely just going to be something completely different. But it was cool to check out today. All right, Chocolateites, thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know if you'd rock this guitar or not, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.